I have on my desk a quarter of a million dollar server, which of course gets an introduction before Mr. <laughs> Allen from Intel. It's worth more than I am. <laughs> <laughs> You've brought a very, very expensive server. Uh, I did. I figured, uh, you know, the whole CES thing was a little bit of a bust this year. <laughs> We're having many CES uh, at level one. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just bring, bring the CES to Wendell. <laughs> Wendell doesn't have to come to the CES. This was literally going to be one of these show floor demos with the four terabytes of persistent memory. Uh, d- yeah. That's not even. That's not even the crazy part. Eighty-eight PCI Express lanes to the front. Yeah, there's no switches. They're all wired. There's no switches in here. They're all just HBAs that are one-to-one, just retimer chips. And so, like, it's, they're literally, this is as, I don't know, I don't even know the right way to describe it. It's just bonkers. It's <laughs> like every, po- almost every possible PCIe lane from every possible connection point on this board. Like, there's, I don't know, there's these SlimSass connectors that go into, like, dual four lanes into a single eight-lane SlimSass just to make these happen. And then there's four of those. So there's like 32 lanes just yep. from the front. And that's what that's what would normally go to like the front panel NVMe of a standard build. Do you know how hard it is to get those cables? I, it's impossible. <laughs> you can't even look these up. I've tried looking up some of these part numbers. Yeah, you, no. you can't even order them right yeah. now. And then, so it's like, well, that's not enough. Okay, well then there's, you know, there's we'll just add these three retimer cards. So that's like another 48 lanes <laughs> because each retimer has two of the slim sass connectors and then those are all going up there. And then that's not enough. That only adds up to 80. So I had to like I couldn't figure out like we got for a eight while. More. I was we like, what? Eight "There's more eight more. Where's the? Where's the? Like I'm doing the math and I'm looking. And no, there's it snuck in here in the back corner, and we'll get some B-roll in there. There's another slim sass that just happens <laughs> to be off of the board here, and then that's routed to another spot over there. <laughs> so this is a super micro chassis. Yeah, and this is designed for very very specialty applications. You are not going to run to your CIO and say, "Hey, we need to buy this." <laughs> this is a this is a server that requires different computer science. Pretty much, yeah. Especially if you're doing the PMEM config. Now, the PMEM config could apply to, you know, you don't need the bonkers front panel stuff to do the PMEM piece of this. But this is just sort of everything all in one yeah. chassis, right? Well, the thing, so computers were never, all of the software that we have now is not designed for persistent memory. And the thing that our viewers probably may not really be super clued into is that because the memory is not persistent, we actually do a lot of Herculean things in software, at least important software, right. to try to make sure that we don't lose data. And so this is the perfect system, you're thinking, for running a database system. Mm-hmm. This is pretty much, you know, you're looking at Oracle as pretty much your only option for software that is actually validated for this kind of a configuration. There are patches for PostgreSQL, don't get me wrong, Mm -hmm. but you run into scalability problems with databases because databases assume that they're going to lose information that's in memory. A Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle and a couple other commercial database uh, systems do have a provision for persistent memory, but it completely changes the performance landscape. If the database server can count on the memory not losing information, then we're talking orders of magnitude speed up in the operation of the database server. And that's yeah. why somebody would pay a quarter of a million dollars for this much persistent memory. Right. And especially if just at the persistent memory level, like each one of these sticks will do, you know, what? Your your Optane, your crazy Optane drives, like you've got... The P5800X. P5800X. Oh, well, we got the two. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got you got a couple of them, and that's, that's you know... but 3.6 just, terabytes. The, those... <laughs> But those devices, your your latencies are, you know, lower than 10 microseconds, which is impressive. It actually dipped down into like the sixes and the sevens when you, depending on if you're in Linux and if you're doing you know, actual, you know, good workloads that can take advantage of it. Uh, the PMAM sticks, you're down to like 0.1 to 0.3. <laughs> A lot more right? bandwidth, in other words. It, it, well, that's for latencies. Yeah. Right? So you can get relatively high bandwidth worth of very small requests that are just peppering the device, right? So that's handy. But then if you do hit it in a straight line, each one of those dims will do over 8 gig per second. (laughs) And there's 16 of them. Yeah. So just in raw bandwidth, I mean, yeah, it's not... You would think that the bandwidth would be uh, higher because it's plugged into a dim slot and you're like, oh yeah, that that should go way faster than that. But then you're just uh, limited at the device level. Yeah. Really, for just how much bandwidth can you get from the Optane chips on the 
you know, on the part itself. And this platform is so bleeding edge that if you wanted to do a mixed configuration, mixed persistent memory and mixed Optane, that's not necessarily going to work either. You're going to have to consult an expert to help you configure that system to make sure that you're not basically specifying an invalid configuration. Right, yeah. So this is 200 series PMEM, which is the newer newer PMEM style. That's what you, you would use for Ice Lake. And then speaking of bunkers config, so this config is... Uh, I don't even think these CPUs are supposed to be in this config because <laughs> uh, they're 8368 Qs, which I think are supposed to be water-cooled oh, SKUs, yeah. or they're meant to be. Uh, but, you know, I'm bending the rules a little because I can, I guess. Um, 400 watts. <laughs> no, they only they still only TDP at 270 watts apiece. <laughs> uh, but they're, bin, they're like three bins higher, so they're, you know, 300 megahertz higher uh, clock for boost. Yeah. Um, so you could you sort of make up the difference because these are only 38 core instead of 40. So yeah, you have the crazy would, bunkers 40 core config. I, yeah, I have the 8380s. I would much rather have these CPUs just because the 8380s, the 8380s are great for a multi-core workload. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're you know, a lot of the hypervisors, I mean, in, Intel, I think, has been working with hypervisors because you get some of the, uh, I've got some of the Skylake and Cascade Lake uh, cast-offs from Amazon. And all Amazon cares about is disable the C states, set the maximum, you know, all core turbo, and forget about it. They, yeah. they literally don't want anything else. And right. the eighty three, the eighty three that is what they're built to do. Mm -hmm. But these with the turbo, where you have kind of a bursty workload, is a much better situation. Yeah, you get a little more speed. Uh, well, actually, even the all core is a little bit better. But it, depending on your workload, if your all core workload is just hitting the two seventy you're basically going to get the same overall speed, you know, regardless of yeah. which part it is, right? Um, but for any of those workloads that are easier on the cores where, you know, you could stick within your TDP budget and still get to a higher turbo, these will go to a slightly higher turbo, which is handy. I've, um, I've also noticed that with the most recent Super Micro BIOS and the Super Micro desktop board that I have with the 8380s, yeah. that uh, they're unlocked, basically. They will turbo in, you know... Uh, oh, you got that working. Until infinity. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as like Tau. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They'll no. They'll just sit at two seventy. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. 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 Well, as long same, as the same goes for these. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. As long as as long as you can you know keep them cool, which is not it's normally not too hard, especially if you've got the Noctua's on the yeah. on your on your crazy desktop system. A little harder on this. <laughs> uh, it just has to be louder. That's all. We'll see that it, in a minute. Yeah. It it does keep them cool. It does keep them you know sixty C. I don't think they get much past sixty C <laughs> even in this build. But the fans are just totally screaming. Yeah. It's yeah. it's just a it's like a fire engine. Well, we've also seen companies like Keoxia with their thirty two terabyte NVMe that would be perfect for the U dot two slots. U dot two U dot three slots in the front of this. Case. Case. Uh, is U.3 the spec that lets you go to SAS as U.2. Well? No, that's still U.2. Yeah, these are all U.2s up front. Okay. Uh, the, in this config, it's a little weird. So it's, we said 88 lanes. You'd actually need more than 88 to get all 24 slots going full speed. So the first two slots, just, I guess, for sheer, hey, this is bonkers enough with 88 lanes. We don't need more. So the first eight physical are SAS and SATA but not the first two slots, or everything but the first two slots will do NVMe. Oh, okay. Right. That, that makes sense because you usually will run a RAID 1 for your OS drive on a system like this right. if you're not doing iSCSI boot off the network. Right, and you don't need your OS drive necessarily sitting on NVMe either. Right. In, in many cases for server builds, the SAS slash SATA is fine. So you put a couple of SATA disks in the first two slots and then your last 22. Uh, or if you wanted whatever that last 10 out of the first 12, you, know, you could do NVMe or SAS you know, for those as well, right? So there's just these three ribbons running up front and each of those three is a quad SAS slash SATA connector, right? So that gives you your first 12, like basically your first half of the bays can do SAS, SATA, and then 10 of those can do NVMe. Yeah, and that's not atypical for a chassis configuration like this. Yeah. And it, it also gives you some full-size PCIe slots, so if you are running some types of accelerators. Yeah, you do have you do have some left. There's not many. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's a few left over here, so you can, you know, if you... Well, the other concern is that maybe you weren't doing everything uh, with store locally to the CPU's storage and not that much bandwidth out of the chassis. So if you need higher bandwidth out of the chassis, at least you do have some more, more lanes. You know, oh, yeah. to be able to do that. You're going to have to add some other neck that's... You we, know. we can put a Mellanox 100 gig neck in there. That's not a problem. I have right. some of those. Right. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> you might need to be a little careful on like, okay, when you get into that bleeding edge, you're probably not messing, like you're NUMA optimizing your workloads, yeah. right? Uh, to the point where you're probably going to want to make sure you have possibly two nicks in there, one nick on each NUMA even, yeah. uh, just for to make sure you're not having a, a bunch of crosstalk between both uh, sockets. Well, right? yeah, that's another that's another point to talk about interesting use cases for this kind of a workload. 
you know, even if you were going for maximum density on some sort of database cluster, your four terabytes of persistent memory in your storage probably would make more sense spread across multiple chassis. Yeah. Because we've uh, for the, the amount of storage that we have and the persistence and uh, the way that the storage architecture is and a whole bunch of the other parameters here, this is uh, workloads that are critical that no information in memory is lost mm -hmm. or possibly crash analysis. You know, you would use this kind of hardware to develop the next generation of hardware because if there is a crash, the system is frozen in the crashed state and you right. could dump the memory through any kind of other slow interface or through a debug interface and see exactly what was in system memory at the time the crash occurred, which is hugely valuable if you're into debugging. Oh yeah, we're, we're still very much in the whole chicken and the egg sort of state with respect to PMEM. Right? Yeah. So as far as people developing, like all these technologies are still evolving, especially software, yeah. to be able to take advantage of this. Um, things have changed, so like these are the blue dims, which is which signifies as 200 series, so there was a 100 series that was the original Black PMM. Gen. Pick some like, of those up on eBay from time to time. Yeah, uh, and and those were you know the prior gen. This is Ice Lake, so you had to be Cascade Lake uh, or possibly Sky Lake, depending. Sky Lake was used for like the really beta system builds. Super for, early for, for super early for the for that original PMM. Uh, but the 100 series, you could do uh, different modes. You can also do different modes here. But the 100 series, you could do uh, um, what's called memory mode, which is it just gives you a huge pool of what looks like DRAM. Right, but it's not all DRAM. It's actually PMEM plus DRAM as the cache, right? Uh, that's like the easiest way out. That's just, I don't want to do any optimization. I just give me a whole bunch of memory and you're not even really benefiting from the persistent ability of the PMEM. You're just benefiting from it's, you know, DIMMs that are up to 512 gig in capacity, which is just bonkers, yeah. right? For, for way cheaper than you would have to pay for a DRAM DIMM of that gig. capacity, yeah. right? Um, but again, not like, not the most optimal thing uh, as far as you know taking the most advantage of the system right if you're trying to do a database server where you did want to be able to reboot the system and still have the data there you reboot this in memory mode it's gonna wipe the dims when next time it boots right so you don't want that you want the other mode which is called app direct and for app direct that's the one where you're up you're actually optimizing your software to take advantage of the dims the dims show up as a separate device they're, they're not added to the memory it's just a really fast you know, really fast storage that just happens to be connected to the same bus as the DRAM. Yeah. Right. And the level of software engineering that Intel's already invested in that, uh, I mean, we're talking thousands of man years of development in order to provide a, you know, a reasonably robust library set so the developers could take advantage of that. And that's some of yeah. those MySQL patches that uh, I was mentioning is that uh, I think some of those, uh, some of the patches that I've read about anyway, depend on the app direct mode mm -hmm. for storage and so they will use uh they will use that for in-flight data and mutexes and locks and some of the database machinery but all of the other stuff still lives in memory so like caches and things that you know it wouldn't really hurt anything if it was lost all of that still lives in memory but again that's way crazy computer science mm -hmm. and so you may be thinking it's this level of investment is absolutely bananas. Is the performance gain from having some fast, persistent memory really worth it? And the answer is, yeah, yeah. yeah. If yeah. With the software was designed for persistent memory, it would be insanely way faster than right. it is today because it doesn't have to worry about losing data. Yeah, and that's the catch, is that the software still, to some degree, has to catch up. Yeah. Right. There's still even in even with respect to DAX and some other things, or where DAX is basically just making a, a file system on the persistent memory. So it still is kind of a workaround. Yeah. Right. Because it's still giving you a standard like block accessible, you know, formatable kind of storage device. Right. That's just almost like a flat file system kind of thing. Um, for some of the performance testing I've been doing where I wasn't that worried about the persistence, but I wanted the memory to be running in app direct and just how fast can I throw IOs at it and things like that. Turns out DAX is actually really slow because DAX is written to try to make sure that the persistence is guaranteed yeah. and that, you know, you've done a write and the writes are atomic, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, the, and you're just, so that will slow things down. And even, even with respect to DAX, there's still optimizations to be done there for that to improve, right? <laughs> I've told you the write has completed. And it has. Yes, yes. As opposed to what a normal NVMe SSDs actually kind of lie to the system. Yeah. Uh, well, they, they cheat. A good one cheats. So like uh, yeah. Samsung 963, which is a fabulous, fabulous enterprise grade 
um, SSD, it has a DRAM cache. Mm-hmm. And so it will tell the operating system, hey, uh, the write has completed when all of the bundle of data is in DRAM. But that's a lie. I mean, you would you would be correct if you're reasoning it out of your mind and saying, wait a minute, if the NVMe loses power just the wrong moment, the Could DRAM still lose it. is going to lose the data. Well, yeah. the 963 is designed with a whole bunch of power capacitors. Mm-hmm. And so... It's literally got a mini standby power system in it to ensure that it has enough power to write out what was in DRAM in 99.999% of scenarios to the flash. Yeah. So when it says the ride is completed, it's in, in fourth dimensionally, it's not lying. Mm-hmm. But if it loses power, there's a special handler in there for that. That's the level of crazy computer engineering yeah, yeah. that we're at. And this is a whole other layer on top of that. Yeah, but like client, you know, NVMe, NAND stuff. No, they don't have that. <laughs> it still it still tells you it's done just if the data's made it onto to the, the device. Yeah. It's either sitting in RAM or a lot of those, especially with DRAMless SSDs now, like DRAMless isn't actually there's no RAM. Like there's some SRAM sitting in the controller and it's it's got a little bit of RAM, right? But for the most part, that data that came in basically just passed right through and went right to the to the NAND chips themselves. And even though it's not committed to the NAND, it's sitting in like the input buffers yeah. on the NAND chips, right? Yeah. It still takes some amount of time for the writes to actually complete. And consumer drives, if they don't have power loss protection capacitors on them, or even in some cases if they do. Which almost all of them don't. Right. Uh, yes, it told the system that it was done. It wasn't actually done. No. So It'll lead know. to corruption when you reboot. It's like, ah. Yeah. It won't necessarily mean the drive's bricked. Or yeah. that you've lost everything because, you know, if it's an NTFS file system, it's journaling. It's, <laughs> it's, there's, there's extra layers of protection there that should protect you. But if you were in the middle of saving a file and the file was reasonably large and then, you know, in that moment power was gone, that file was probably corrupt. NTFS right? was designed for files, for devices that lie about that. So, yeah. again, it's kind of like a, you know, yeah. drives have lied about whether or not they've completed the write since spinning rust days. So, yeah. So, that yeah, that journaling part of NTFS is at least to make sure that you know, protect it from uh, if it happens to be in the middle of updating the table that tells you where all the stuff is, yeah. that's really bad for, to lose, right? So at least that's the thing that's journaled. But it's not journaling every single, like, write of data yeah. to the drive. It's just journaling the really important stuff to make sure your, your partition doesn't go away and things like that. Or you you know, can't find your files anymore. That would be pretty bad. And we still can't 100% trust that. Right. Yeah. It really is completely so, crazy. Safety tips is get an ups. <laughs> and even that, because you know, we, it's even with you know, even with the failure, crash. Yeah, you know, crash is pretty much the same thing. Yeah, because if a crash occurs and the software, the crash is bad enough, the software doesn't have a chance to write it out. Yeah, if you get a blue screen, there's stuff in the blue screen handler to try to flush whatever's in the buffers to disk. But if things break hard enough. It won't be able to do that. Uh, sometimes uh, PCI Express, well, you know, in this intrepid journey from PCI Express four and five, foreshadowing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've created situations for consumers and others where they're getting a lot of PCIe bus errors trying to use certain devices, or even with uh, you know our PCIe adapters. Or I'm trying to get P5800X to run through Sketchy from China, PCI Express oh, adapters. Yeah, yeah. Well, I own a few. I own a few of these adapters. These are the good ones. These ones actually will work. They'll link at Gen 4, two drives. You can get into obscure situations where, you know, the file system driver was not able to flush the buffer because of PCI Express bus errors. Yeah. And so um, the data that made it to the drive that the drive wrote was mangled somehow. And then that leads to corruption and problems and all sorts of other things. But yep. when you have something that is persistent, all of that machinery can go away. And so all of the overhead and... You know, it becomes the next most low-hanging fruit that you completely re-engineer that the way the computer works with persistent memory as the next way to get the next bump in performance. And that is a level of insanity. Yeah, there's there's a lot of, especially on the client side, if you have a regular, regular old Windows PC, like your gaming PC or whatnot, and you have a drive that's flaky, that's starting to like hang on writes and stuff like that, it, that thing will go for a few minutes with the data just sitting in the buffer. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and you'll you'll know the telltale sign is eventually the mouse will will freeze on the system, or just other <laughs> weird things will start happening, right? But it'll go minutes. Yeah. Where that was data that you thought was written to the disk a minute ago. <laughs> nope, it's still sitting in the memory. Yeah. It's, it hasn't even made it to the device yet because of bus errors or because of some other, you know, flakiness to the device level. Yeah. 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 And this is also a kind of engineering where it's not enough that you have to make the device. 
no one is going to adopt the device immediately because the entire rest of the ecosystem doesn't exist. Yeah. So it's a, and that's where we are with computers is like, you have to invest in the software side and the engineering and the hardware side, and then putting everything together into a product that is accessible to pleb tier developers. Yeah. Because if you're, you know, an ivory tower tier developer, you're already working for Google or Facebook or Amazon or Microsoft or somebody. And you're probably working on special sauce like this to drive Azure, or you're dictating some of the hardware here. And I'm sure that the Intel is working really closely with huge companies to build stuff like this, because this also gives them a competitive advantage. If you are a day zero customer for stuff like this, you can have a 10 X performance improvement from this technology. Mm -hmm. That's why it's exciting. Yeah. It's cool stuff. And folks like Wendell and myself are the ones that or in the really bleeding edge where we run into the weird errors and try to fix them before it finally gets to the, you know, somebody has to put the system in the crazy config <laughs> my role, and actually beat up on it to, to figure out what shakes out. My role, I assure you, is janitorial in nature. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Give yourself some credit, man. You and I are working on some weird stuff together there. Where, where, you know, do you see this weird bug? No, yeah, yeah, I got this weird bug. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've definitely run into some weirdness. <laughs> and so, it's like, why is this happening? Is this happening to me? And then it's like you try to chase it down, and it's like, oh, this is an intermittent bug, and I just, I don't, I want to. Just Wendell, you know, I just happen to be, you know, moving uh, 100 gigabytes per second worth of worth of bandwidth around <laughs> between two parts of the system. And, oh, and then this weird thing happens. Oh, oh, because yeah. people always do, you know, dozens or hundreds of gigabytes per second of bandwidth. <laughs> Another crazy thing about this is that it's basically a peripheral more than a memory device, but yeah. You had to use the memory bus for the peripheral because the PCIe bus was too slow. Yeah, or there wasn't enough of it. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, just think of how many sheer lanes. Uh, you know, that's 16 SSDs. We need another interface. Yeah. 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 And the other bonkers thing is just the ice lake with the eight, you know, eight memory channels per socket. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, there's a whole other conversation to be had about like memory coherency across processes and the machinery that's happening under the hood that programmers and even operating system designers don't really know all of the black magic that is going into oh, making yeah. sure when you write something to one place in memory, that thing that was might have been cached somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So did you let everybody know that had that cached that that's different now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and there's so much extra logic that has to be in just a system like this where... You know, even if you're doing something where you think it's just on one socket. Yeah, like, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's behind the scenes. It's actually duplicating some of it, some of that memory contents even over to the other socket just to make sure that in case one of those threads happens to go over here to the other socket, yeah. you want the data to be at least local and not have to come across you if know, the, later. If the, if the cache right? is desynced, it can no longer be said to be coherent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which one do you trust? And it's like, ah, oh, throw it all out, go back to main memory. And it's like, mm. yeah, there's so many layers of extra stuff. Like it's, it's one of those just infinite rabbit holes of once you start to dig into it and you realize just how many, how many, uh, how many moments in, in the history where you had an engineer somewhere that went, oh, yeah, we should definitely make an extra copy over here for this. Yeah. You know, and then you realize that there's so many extra layers of machinery going on just to make it a seamless experience for someone who doesn't know how to tune around all that stuff. Yeah. Someone who just, hey, I just want to run a program. Yeah. Right. Whereas, you know, something this bonkers as a system, like the perfect configuration is more akin to treating it as if it was two separate systems. Yeah. Right. Where, you you know, you make sure you're very careful about what things you put where and which lanes you're using for what to the point where like the the perfect optimum config is literally you could just like cut this saw this in half and just yeah you know it would just be two indiv individual systems where but then the bandwidth between those two systems is not as much right. as the bandwidth from socket to socket right which is another different interface that we haven't even talked about <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean 16 dims 256 gigabytes per dim two sockets 38 cores per socket 88 pci express lanes and a crap load of nvme drives across the front this is yeah you know in 10 or 20 years this is still not going to be a commodity server this would still be a high-end server in a decade yeah this isn't one of those like you know dell whatever you find on ebay for your for your home lab yeah, yeah. no i don't think it's you're like, gonna these are like, not gonna oh be. my fortune 500 ordered 24 racks of these it's like no, <laughs> no. Goldman, <laughs> goldman sachs ordered about four of them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right i'm wendell 
I'm Alan. And we're gonna we're gonna go play with the server now. But yeah. I thought this would be a fun chat to share. You know, show off quarter of a million dollar server. Show oh off the gosh. crazy toys. This is a crazy, you know, I'm a crazy storage guy. I got to bring the crazy storage. Thing. Well, hey, I'm always down for uh, more toys to play with. <laughs> For at least a little while. you got to take it back with you. But, uh, I you do, know, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sorry. It's so a little bit of pre-release hardware here, too. So, But, yeah. hey, speed. Got to go fast. Uh, next up, we've got a video on PCI Express 5 on Alder Lake. Yeah. So, More crazy storage stuff. Yeah. I think it might be the first look at PCI Express 5 because CES was canceled. It's true. Well, it wasn't canceled, but it basically was. CES didn't cancel. Everybody canceled CES. All right, let's get to the next video because everyone, <laughs> everyone's already clicked away looking for the next video. Woo! All right. All right.